Greetings. Tony from Old River Hard Goods again. Today's subject, as you can see from the title, is about clamps or cramps, as our English friends call them. There are over 200 patents for clamps, and we're going to talk about a few that were produced. A lot of them never made it into production. Got some interesting wooden ones. Some you may have seen before, some you may not, and a couple other bits and bobs. And as always, there's a couple of great flea market find sections to peruse at the end, so stay tuned. We're going to start our little talk today with the Colt patent clamps. Alva M. Colt of Batavia, New York, got his first clamp patent in April 27th of 1880. That was for a specialized wheelwright's clamp. Those are pretty uncommon. Um, this one here has the February 8th, 1881 patent, which is uh, probably the most commonly one found on this style of clamp. It has the steel bar, or I actually cast iron bar, and the eccentric lever to operate it. Now, some folks get confused. They think the lever should be engaged when it's down. It's actually engaged when it's up. And these guys work pretty well. About the only real problems you see with them is, of course, the pads go missing. And this little tab here gets broken off. But other than that, you know, unless somebody's been using one to pound nails with or something like that, they're definitely a, a good investment. Now, in the picture here, I've got another one of these uh, 1881 patents. Uh, later on in the company life, and they were around for, for a long time, they had a uh, April 4th, 1911 patent for a C-clamp they carried over to the one on the right side of the picture here that used a hollow steel frame instead of the cast iron frame. They also made this style clamp with both with the eccentric as well as the screw. Don't see those too often for some reason. They also made in a later incarnation of these and another patent as well. He was real good about patent in his work. Instead of a pad like this there was a second jaw that rode on the rail here that the lever would push and engage. And they had some, some really, really neat tools. And like I said, you know, as long as it's in good working shape, these are definitely worth the money because they've lasted a couple lifetimes already and they'll last a couple more. Here we have a pair of iron clamps made by the Cincinnati Tool Company. They were in business from 1879 until 1962 and made a variety of tools besides clamps, including spoke shaves. Albert Farmer and John Hargrave, who was also the president of the Cincinnati Tool Company, were granted patent number 1639561 in August of 1927 for the design of these clamps. And they're pretty solid tools. Nicely made. Note the filigree work on the jaws. They have a sliding piece here. They're toothed on the bottom. They're in on the top mostly. That locks and engages. And of course you got the screw to tighten it up. And I'll tell you what. These guys work whole lot better than them plastic monsters they're selling these days, but that's, of course, my opinion. And like the other makers I'm talking about on here, you know, these are still out there if you know where to look for them. And the last of our iron clamps is this Stearns 12-inch model. It uses a spring-loaded ratchet under here to engage a cogged or tooth section on the bottom. This one unfortunately is missing the pad, which is why it's still here. But it's kind of neat, a little different. Again, cast iron body. This one's marked USPO. 
I don't know if that's post office or patent office. It's just stamped there. Can't find a patent on it. Did some looking. There might be one out there under a different name, but wasn't registered by Stern. So, but again, it's a neat, neat clamp. If you can find one with the pad, sure be a good user. Like a lot of these, the bar is bent a little bit. Well, these things got used hard. And put away wet more than once. <clears throat> and of course, there are wooden clamps. They've been around a lot longer than the iron clamps have been. On the left here, we have a standard twin screw parallel clamp of sorts. This one was made by the a and Manufacturing in Chicago. I don't know anything about them. It's one I keep around here for the shop to use. This one's somewhat recent as far as make. You can see the screw threads have got some things there and what have you. But these were made in a variety of sizes. I mean, I've had them as small as 3 inches, and I've got some uh, that I collected go up to 18 and even 20 inches in length. Um, let me tell you, you don't want to pay for the shipping on one of those bad boys. But they are still handy. They're still very useful. I see them around all the time. Uh, although sometimes guys at the flea market seem to think they're made of gold rather than wood. Uh, there are some collectible ones, uh, particularly if you find one of the original Stanley ones with the eagle trademark stamped on the end. And it will say Stanley on it. Uh, Stanley did reproduce those for their, uh, I don't know, one of their Centennials or Bicentennial. I don't forget what it was. But, um, not the reproduction ones, but the, actually the originals. If they're in good working shape, at least they used to bring some good money. Another style of clamp, and this one doesn't show up too often. This is a harness maker's clamp. Pretty simple construction. You've got a joint there, a kind of slightly angled joint, a leather hinge, it's just nailed in place, and a single screw. Normally, this is just used for holding two pieces of leather together to be stitched, but I've used them over the years for things like holding down veneer, uh, glue and boxing back in the planes, uh, you name it. I actually have two of these guys, I just can't find the second one, but these are neat and very collectible. Um, I wish I could find a few more of them, but usually when I find them, the leather's really bad or the screws are boogered up. This one has some chipping, but I don't get out that far with it anyway. So, but another clamp you run into from time to time are the wooden C clamps shown in the picture here. A lot of these were factory made with finger joints, as you can see there. And that's about the only real problem you see with them is you know, sort of the short of the threads on the screw being stripped as the uh, joints starting to come apart or they get dry rod and everything starts breaking. But I've only had a couple of those over the years, although I have seen, seen enough of them around. But anyways... These are also good users and great collectibles. And of course, with uh, wooden clamps, you also have the longer bar clamps like this one. It's got a screw here, just about, eh, about 10 inches or so. There's a nail or point set in the end to help hold it on the work and then you've got this movable shoe with an iron uh, catch on it that fits in the notches these are called carcass or frame clamps and again this one's you know, this one's about three foot long three and a half foot long i've seen these as long as six seven foot long doing bed frames and stuff like that this one's in kind of rough shape and honestly it's been hanging around the shop for more years than i care to remember but again like i said i did have a thing for collecting clamps and i picked up a few weird ones over the years 
And last on our tour of wooden clamps is this axe handle maker's clamp. Now I know some folks have said, oh, it looks like a treadle lathe bed, but it's not because it was never mounted to anything. It's 37 inches long. The movable head here, try and not shadow it out too bad, um, travels about a foot. You've got the screw here, which can be just to lock the stock down. At this end, you've got a fixed head with a point on it. And let's see if I can stand this up so you can get a view from this angle. And these are used for other applications as well. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has, in the Pennsylvania State Museum, has a complete chairmaker shop, similar to what uh, they did with the Domini workshops down at the Winterthur Museum in Delaware. They took this entire shop and reconstructed it inside an enclosure inside the uh, museum building. And one of the exhibits sitting in a vise is a clamp like this holding up a cabriole chair leg. So uh, this style saw more uses than for axe handles, but again, they show up once in a great while. I've sold one or two over the years. Didn't, don't remember shipping them, but tool shows or what have you. But this one needs a wedge for the bottom. It's been long gone and... This is another piece that I've had here forever, and honestly, I had to wipe about a quarter of an inch of dust off of it, but still, it's a neat piece, and definitely something you do not find every day. And last, while we're on the subject of clamps, even though this is not a woodworking clamp, I figured, well, might as well toss it into the mix. James Cunningham of Dushore, Pennsylvania, which is located in the north central part of the state, north of Bloomsburg area, was granted a patent on February 7th, 1893 for a harness maker's clamp, which as you can see from the patent picture has a stand, which I don't have. Uh, supposedly he ran a hardware store up there. I had done some research on this guy a number of years ago and had to do some digging to find it again, but it's just marked patent. February 7th on the bottom, and I haven't cleaned it or anything yet. This will clean up eh, not too bad. About the only thing that's missing one of the nuts on the bracket screw there, but the main screw still works, at least partially, and get some of the grunge off of it. And, well, this would be a nice collectible piece for someone that's into that. And, Stamp could be easily fabricated and for a whole lot less money than it would cost to ship one. But it's a neat, neat old tool and definitely a collectible one at that. Well, Saturday's flea market was a bust. When I went to bed at 9.30, they were calling for rain at 5 a.m., and I got up at 4.30 a.m., and of course it wasn't raining, but I was only one of the few who got that memo, so there wasn't much to be seen and nothing to be had. Sunday, it was 55, a little foggy, but not too bad out. Comfortable walking weather for sure, and while not as good as previous weeks, I did manage to score a few things. Uh, there's an 18-inch, number 26, Starrett outside caliper, uh, union hook rule, a couple of Starrett rules, a, uh, oh, I don't know, I forget the name on this one, but that's kind of a new new rule there, a uh, brown and sharp, 6-inch combination square rule, kind of rough, but can't hurt to have around. Another brown and sharp in pretty good shape. A uh, This one's the Protractor. Again, not too bad a shape. Uh, Stanley. Rule and level. Tri-square. That one's going to take some cleaning. A user grade. Starrett. 12-inch combination square. That one I'll probably want to repaint the head on because it's kind of funky. 
Uh, don't see a name on this guy, but it's a two and a half pound ball peen hammerhead. That, yeah, that'll clean up all right. A Greenlee bench gouge, not too bad a shape. This one's a fine if you can see the mark, because I can barely see it. But this one's an Atha. I think this one's a two ounce ball peen. That one's worth some money. But that was it for the first market, other than some stuff I got for me. And the second market, which is always hit and miss with getting there late, didn't turn up too much. One little user crafted screwdriver, one big turn screw, it's going to need a whole bunch of work, and a pretty neat hand forged farrier's hammer with a long snout on it. It was a time people were going absolutely gaga over these things. Now, well, I don't know, but it's got a good handle on it. Guy said it was a plum, but I don't see the name on it, so most of these guys make stuff up as they go anyways. But, hey, not a great pile, but at least I'll pay for the gas. Well, it was another cold morning at the Wednesday flea market, being right about 32 degrees, and I am so over this cold weather. Pickens were kind of slow, but I did manage to pull some volume out of it. So, here goes nothing. Oh, got an orphan chisel handle. Three founder spoons for sand casting. Uh, yeah, well used little chisel, but that kind of came in a box of stuff. C.S. Osborne wooden mallet with a little paint on it. This one's kind of neat. It's a Williams Universal. Not quite sure what you use it for, but I guess I'll have to figure it out. A Stearns. Uh, number 85, door butt gauge. See the Stanleys all the time, but you don't find too many Stearns. Uh, here's a find and a half. A <coughs> King Cutter, K191 Rabbit Plane. Needs a depth stop, but I'm sure I can dig one out someplace. A Stanley Sweetheart, 66 and a half rule, needs some cleaning. A really neat user-made screwdriver. That one's kind of nice. Blacksmith tongs, small flat jaws. That one's also pretty neat. A pair of Brookstone Japan model makers clamps. A uh, Lufkin machinist ruler, combination square ruler clamp. A Starrett 289A uh, machinist ruler clamp. Uh, put them together at an angle. A another Miller Falls tool handle. Rosewood tool handle with seven bits in the handle. A hand chuck. Not too bad. PSW 10 bending pliers. Missing the screws, but a lot of guys didn't use them anyways, and they're standard thread rivet set hand forged even finding too many of those guys around at all a pair of round faced ten seamers both of them hand forged those guys are getting few and far between as well and a morel patent uh, saw set yeah, I need some cleaning but well, we'll beat it in shape so Hey, not a great pile, but it's better than nothing. And that's all for this one, folks. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed my little presentation. And please hit that subscribe button if you'd like to be notified when new videos are posted. As always, thanks for watching, and bye.